Hi, I'm Denise. Um, we're, we have with us today Daniel J. Sonkin, PhD, and a licensed marriage and family therapist who has been in independent practice in Sausalito since 1981. He has recently developed the Secure Based Priming Program and is about to start collecting data on the effect of repeating, repeated priming on attachment security and mood. He is the recipient of the 1989 Clark Vinson Award for Literary Contribution to the Field of Marriage and Family Therapy and is the 2000 recipient of the Distinguished Clinical Member Award from the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. It's so good to see some familiar faces and new faces and to hear that so many of you are interested in um, attachment and neuroscience, uh, two of the loves in my life besides my wife and my daughter and our dog. So um, not in that order. <laughs> wife, daughter, dog, attachment, neuroscience. That's probably more accurate. So um, basically what I want to do today is, is talk to you a little bit about, um, give you an, just very, uh, you know, brief overview of attachment theory and uh, talk about uh, the idea of secure attachment and how what we all do to one degree or another is um, uh, help people become, have more secure attachments, essentially. Um, we may all kind of approach it from a very different perspective. There were a lot of different um, uh, theories and concepts that people presented in their introductions about um, you know, mind, body, you know, different types of approaches and different populations. But we're all pretty much moving in, in the same direction. And especially when you think about it, in terms of brain science. We're helping people have more integrated um, uh, experience in their brains. We're helping them with affect regulation. And of course, that's going to help in terms of uh, cognitive control and, and cognitive functioning. So we're, we're all, I, I see what we're all involved with is, is very similar work, but we're approaching it from different uh, uh, perspectives. So this is just really kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you a little um, uh, overview of attachment theory uh, in a nutshell, talk to you about the main differences between secure and insecure attachment. Um, what's so great about attachment security? Obviously, if that's something that you're wanting to work with, you have to kind of sell the idea to yourself first before you sell it to your clients talk about attachment theory and psychotherapy and uh, what is the intersection and how do they relate because attachment theory is a developmental theory um, in, its, in, in its core um, uh, um, structure and talk about a little bit about attachment in the brain. There's a, a lot of exciting research out there right now uh, because uh, uh, imaging technology has gotten so cheap and, and so available that you now have psychologists, uh, um, psychology departments who have their access to imaging uh, technology so that they can run their experiments um, uh, using uh, um, scanners. Um, there was one that was just released uh, this week, or maybe it was the end of last week, that came out of um, uh, the University of Exeter in, in England, where they were looking at the amygdala, which is, you know, the part of our brain that scans for danger and, and threat, and they were looking at secure-based priming and its effect on the amygdala. And, and what they were doing was working with people uh, who had PTSD and talking about this idea that you can reduce reactivity by using priming. It's fascinating stuff. So obviously I'm very excited about it. Um, the way I got involved in, in neuroscience is my wife, who's a child psychologist, um, um, who uh, got retrained as a neuropsychologist in the late 90s and she started bringing home these books and I'm reading them and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, wow, this is like uh, I know so little about the brain, and yet it's the thing that we're all attempting to change, functioning in. And so it just got me very, very excited, and I can't read enough about neuroscience. So obviously it's, it's something I'm very uh, excited about. And then I want to talk to you in, at the end about boosting uh, attachment security using priming. And um, I, I brought you, I, I'm, you'll get to ha be primed here. Okay, I'm going to give you an experience of what priming is about. And uh, as, as Denise mentioned, I am beginning to start collect data. Right now, 
the, the website is just collecting very, very general on a non-clinical population um, from all over the world. People are taking the priming studies, uh, you know, priming exercises. But I've just redone the whole website just this week and it went online. So instead of delivering three primes a day, I'm only delivering one prime a day to people. And then I'm hoping to be able to deliver primes in other ways. I was telling Denise prior to the um, uh, talk that um, uh, there's a group in England that delivers secure-based primes via text. And they're finding it is just as effective as bringing people into the laboratory. So, so it just kind of gets me thinking about how do we expand our conceptualization of psychotherapy? Because if, in fact, we are trying to change the brain and the way the brain is organized in the way it's, and what neural circuitry gets activated at certain times and under certain conditions, when you really think about how um, difficult it is to change biology, anybody who's either been on a diet, gotten onto an exercise program, or is losing cognitive function and is trying to strengthen uh, their, their cognitive function, like working memory or something like that, you know it's an uphill battle. And the reason why it's an uphill battle is because we're working against biology. And so it makes me think that, you know, yeah, it would be great if you saw somebody seven times a week, but, well, I don't know if I'd want to see somebody seven times a week, <laughs> but, but the reality is it takes a lot more intervention than once a week, 50 minutes, to change what we're trying to change. And there's great uh, literature in the, um, so a few people mentioned their uh, interest in mind-body and mindfulness. We look at the work of Richard Davidson and John Kabat-Zinn. What they did was they, they looked at how, uh, how, how many interventions of mindfulness does it take to change the way, to strengthen the left prefrontal area of the brain, which is the part of the brain that is um, uh, uh, involved in regulating approach emotions, compassion, gratitude, love, you know, excitement, those kinds of things, joy. And uh, it, it turned out that it would took 60 repetitions, 60 30-minute sessions over two months to change, to strengthen that part of the brain. There's some also really interesting research out of uh, England on habits and how many times it takes to change a habit. And I don't know if any of you have read, read, read this, but um, uh, it's fascinating that, you know, the, the range was between 200 and uh, between the 18 and 265 repetitions, but the average was about 65. 65 repetitions in order to change a habit. And what is a habit? A habit is just simply a, a, a built-in um, uh, neural net profile in the brain that gets activated under certain uh, cer situations. And so it, it really speaks to this idea that of thinking outside the box and doing more than just what we do in, in the face-to-face you know, -face encounter with clients, which I think is also very important. Um, but um, um, sometimes it, it feels, somebody even mentioned, oh, it's really, you know, I'm a very, very difficult client with a child with reactive attachment. They're all difficult. I, I don't know about you, but I find everybody's, I'm difficult. You know, when I think about my 20 years in Jungian analysis, I must have driven my analyst crazy because, you know, it was a slow process. And, um, and so I think that, that maybe doing something else, something different, can help. So, um, so this is just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the small type, I wanted to um, minimize the number of slides as, as possible. Um, but attachment theory, what, you know, a lot of times people ask, well, what is attachment theory? What is it in its, its, in its, in its essence? Um, and it's really um, a, a theory that attempts to explain how secure attachment develops and how secure attachment in and of itself helps people um, get through difficult moments, difficult times, and uh, times of distress, and reestablish balance and calm and emotional equanimity, okay? So it helps people survive temporary bouts of pain, discomfort, doubts and distress, and helps them reestablish hope, optimism, and emotional equanimity, okay? That's what secure attachment does for people. Um, it, but it also explains how various forms of attachment insecurity develop and how insecurity in and of itself 
interferes with emotion regulation, social adjustment, and, and, and mental health. So one person, Alan Schroff at the University of, of, of Minnesota, um, which has a huge, very, very uh, highly reputable attachment lab that's done the uh, Minnesota um, uh, longitudinal study. They've been following people from 12 months of age into their late 30s now. Okay, they've been following them. In other words, they've been looking at continuity of attachment. They've, they've, they've produced hundreds and hundreds of articles and research studies. And uh, what Alan says is that, um, that if you, if you want to conceptualize attachment theory in, in its most basic form, it is a theory of affect regulation. Okay? Um, when you think about, again, secure attachment, then what does it speak about their affect regulation? Well, they're adaptive and they're flexible. That's the best two ways of describing their, their way of regulating affect. They're adaptive. In other words, they can, they can change and, 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 and relate to different situations and have different, uh, uh, allow themselves to have different forms of affect. But they're also flexible as to um, how they deal with their affect. In other words, they upregulate when they need to, they downregulate when they need to. They are not hooked into one particular method of, of um, regulating emotion. Insecurely, then consequently, would be the opposite. They tend to be less adaptive and they tend to be more inflexible. So the, the hallmark of insecure attachment really is are, are people who, are, who habitually downregulate or habitually upregulate, okay? And we can talk a little bit about why that's a problem. But, you know, wh what's the expression in, in the 12-step programs? Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That's the, the, that's that, co that concept or that saying is really what it, it speaks to the idea that we're trying to do the same thing in all situations. And of course, that just, you know, if you, if you just have one strategy to your approach to life or approach to conflict or your approach to relationships, inevitably you're going to run into a situation that's going to require a different response. And if you're not, if you don't have flexibility, cognitive flexibility, um, then you're going to run into trouble, right? And that's actually part of the problem with being um, for therapists is that we have oftentimes we have a particular approach to clients and we're always running into people who require us to move off our set, to move off what we're used to doing and try something different, okay? So if you think of regulating affect on a continuum from downregulating to upregulating, securely attached people are in the middle. They're, 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 they're people that can flow, they can move as, as the situation calls for. And, and insecurely attached people tend to be stuck at either end. It's interesting that um, uh, Mary Main, who is at the University of California at Berkeley, a very famous attachment researcher, the, the person who developed the adult attachment interview. Um, uh, she, uh, no, actually I'm thinking of Mary Ainsworth, sorry, not Mary Main. Mary Ainsworth, who brought attachment theory to the United States, who was, um, uh, actually she was on my wife's dissertation committee, so it's my, my connection to a Mary Ames is through my wife. And um, uh, uh, she called secure uh, babies B babies, and she concert, uh, called the avoidant babies A babies, and she called the resistant babies C babies. And everyone used to ask her, why are the secure babies B babies? They should be A babies, grade A, you know? And she explained that just like that. She said, A babies are over here, C babies are over here, but B babies, they can be anywhere in between. So it's that idea of flexibility. So insecurely attached people tend to habitually uh, downregulate or upregulate, and now getting into some of the developmental aspects of this, how does this evolve over time? It's, it's this idea that our brains are primed by early childhood experiences. Um, and the priming is just another word for learning. 
It's how do we learn things, and priming is one way in which we learn things, is through experience, okay? So um, our brains are primed for one of these styles based on early experience. The research shows the most robust um, predictor of the attachment style of, a, of an infant to its parent is the attachment of its, the parent to their, vis-a-vis -vis the adult attachment of their a parent to, to their parents, okay? So the most robust predictor, so in other words, um, parents who have secure attachment tend to Im imbue secure attachment in their children. Parents who have insecure attachment tend to imbue insecure attachment in their children. And, and it goes for the type of insecure attachment too. So uh, parents who are, have a dismissing attachment um, tend to have a more dismissing attached infants and children, and uh, parents with um, uh, preoccupied tend to have more of the anxious attachment, and disorganized tend to have the more disorganized children. And there's a, a lot of good stuff written that kind of explains how that all evolves, but it has a lot, to, it has mostly to do with the type of parenting, the type of interactions, how they handle distress in their infant, okay? Uh, there's also a cognitive aspect, so this is all emotional, so we're talking about emotion regulation, but there's also a cognitive aspect to attachment as well. And this was what John Bowlby called internal working models, okay? But it, 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 and it refers to the individual's beliefs about their own worthiness and the safety of others. The world is either a, gen, a, a benign place or I feel worthy of receiving support and caring. And these working models are essentially memories. You know, they're not like, there's not a, a part of the brain that, 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 you know, that is, you know, says the world is a safe place or, or not. It's based on, on memories, based on, on experiences growing up. And those memories um, become a part of who we are. They become, uh, I just read this really a fascinating study of this, of this group that's looking at um, um, couple relationships and uh, uh, how couples uh, um, uh, become more like each other over time. And one of the things that they, well, you know, this is true, right? You know, that, you know, you start looking alike, you start talking alike. And, you know, what is that about? Well, what is that about is that you, uh, when you interact with somebody, that interaction becomes a part of you. It becomes a, a part of who we are. And so, um, because it's in our memory, because memory is who we are. I mean, when you, when you think about what, who you are as a person, it's a culmination of all your memories, of all your experiences, okay? Now, some of those memories are what's called explicit memories. In other words, you remember where you went on vacation last summer or something like that. But a lot of them are implicit. In other words, they're just kind of in you and they manifest without much consciousness or awareness, okay? And that's what attachment memories are because so much of, of our experience of attachment begins prior to having explicit memory. In other words, it's, it all starts you know, some people say it starts even before childbirth, but it, it does start, for the most part, at childbirth, and those experiences are all processed as implicit memories, not explicit memories. I mean, many, most people don't remember things in their lives prior to four years of age. Think about the millions of interactions that occur between four years, uh, between zero and four, and that those memories become a part of who we are, like couples, an infant and their mother, or an infant and their father, um, become more like each other because simply because of the interactions that occur, okay? So, secure attachment. Um, this is based on the work of Phil Shaver, who's at the um, uh, University of California at Davis. Phil is actually um, one of the um, uh, developers of secure base priming. Him and his colleague from Israel, uh, Mario Michelenser, they developed the secure base priming concept, okay, back in 2000. Anyhow, Phil um, uh, has done most of his work with adult attachment, whereas people like Mary, Main, uh, Mary Ainsworth and, and the Minnesota um, uh, Project 
um, and, and Everett Waters um, at, in, at SUNY, uh, Stony Brook. These people have devoted their lives to children. Um, you also have uh, adult attachment researchers as well. And Phil is a social psychologist and has actually did his first uh, research in loneliness. So you can see how that can kind of morph into attachment theory. So, um, so what does he say about um, secure adults? Well, they've mastered the complexities of close relationships sufficiently well and sufficiently is key here. They're, no one's perfect. Secure people have their, their sorus and they have their aggravation and they have their difficulties in life, just like everybody else. As one of my analysts said, secure ta securely attached people fall into holes just like everybody else. They just have an easier time getting out of them, okay? Uh, but they have um, mastered the complexities of close relationships sufficiently well to allow them to explore and play without needing to keep vigilant watch over their attachment figure. That's more the preoccupied people, right? And without needing to protect themselves from their attachment figures, insensitive or rejecting behaviors. And most importantly, the, the, the hallmark of attachment security is that you, you seek proximity to your attachment figure because you know that that is gonna help you reduce stress and anxiety. That's really, the thing that, that they've learned in their life is that you go to your attachment figures and, um, and you will feel better. That's the whole, the whole point of attachment to begin with. One of the most important points of attachment is to relieve you, yourself from distress and anxiety. Um, so they tend to be highly invested in relationships because, you know, you, if you think of relationships as places that are soothing and, and you receive care and comfort and love, you're gonna be highly invested in those relationships. They tend to have long, stable relationships, okay? Their relationships are characterized by trust and friendship. They seek support when under stress. They're generally responsive to the support. In other words, we have all seen this who work with couples, you know, somebody will say, you don't want to talk to me, but then when the person talks there or provides support, they, they, they push it away. So, but securely attached people, not only do they seek care and comfort, but they know how to receive care and comfort from their partner. They tend to be empathic and supportive to others. They're flexible in response to conflict. They have higher self-esteem and they have in general positive working models of self or others. This is the the Bowlby conceptualization of models of self and others. They tend to see themselves as worthy and they tend to see relationships through a benign lens, close relationships through a benign lens. On the other hand, what do insecurely attached people um, um, experience? Well, let's talk about dismissing because um, uh, there's three different types of insecure attachment. Um, what begins with an attempt to regulate attachment behavior and relationship to a primary caregiver who does not provide contact, comfort, or soothe distress becomes self de a defensive self-reliance. Cool and distant relationships with partners and cool or hostile relationships with peers. So these are the people who down-regulate their need for closeness and connection, okay? Um, so they're relatively uninvested in romantic partners. They have a high breakup r rate than the preoccupied, higher breakup rate. They tend to grieve less after breakup, so they do feel lonely. They tend to withdraw when feeling emotional distress. They tend to cope by ignoring or denying problems. They can be very critical of their partner's needs. They tend to be very critical when somebody is needing connection because don't forget they're downplaying that need in themselves. Uh, they may have a history of bullying. And they might have a positive, positive model of self. They see themselves as worthy of receiving support, but they do not see others as providing that. Okay? Preoccupied, this tends to be what's called the anxious insecure attachment. What begins with attempts to keep track of or hold on to an unreliable caregiver. So, with dismissing, the caregivers were reliably unavailable. You get that? Reliably unavailable, consistently unavailable. With preoccupied, it's unreliably available. Sufficiently unavailable, not completely unavailable, but sufficiently unavailable 
to create anxiety in the child. So um, uh, they try to hold on to or keep track of an unreliable caregiver during infancy leads to an attempt to hold on to partners. But this is done in ways that frequently backfire and produce more hurt feelings, anger, and insecurity. So they tend to be obsessed with romantic partners. They suffer from extreme jealousy. They have a high breakup and get back together rate. They worry about rejection. They can be intrusive and controlling. They can assert their own needs without regards for their partner's needs. And they may have a history of being victim, victimized by bullies. And they have a negative working model of self. Their, tends, their problem tends to be more around self-esteem. And this positive model of others, I can only be loved by others. I can only be okay with the other. So there's an overemphasis on the value of the other and an underemphasis on self-sufficiency. Whereas the, the dismissing is an overemphasis on, on self-sufficiency, okay? And then this is the disorganized, what begins with conflicted, disorganized, a disoriented behavior in relation to a frightening or frightened caregiver may translate into desperate, ineffective attempts to regulate attachment anxiety through approach avoidance. This is, um, uh, uh, you know, sounds familiar to you because it's, it, it, this, this category is highly correlated with borderline personality disorder. Uh, they tend to be more introverted, unassertive. They tend to feel exploited. They lack self-confidence and are self-conscious. They feel more negative than positive about themselves. They tend to be very anxious, depressed, hostile, or could be violent, self-defeating, report a lot of physical il illness, and fluctuates between neediness and withdrawal. And they have negative models of self and others. Yeah? Okay, too fast? I'm just nervous about the time. Okay. Calm down. <laughs> Take a deep breath. <sighs> I have a two o'clock appointment in San Rafael. Yeah, you know, um, oh, hey, don't try to write all this stuff down. Um, this stuff is on my website, and I think they're going to put it on the Red Redwood um, camp. So I'll put the, the first slide on again, and uh, you, can go to, you can just go to my, uh, my page, my home page, and you'll see there on the lower left-hand corner, presentations, recent presentations. And the very first one is this one, and you, it says download slides, and you just click on that link, and you'll have all the slides, okay? So, forgot to say that. Uh, it's danielsonkin.com. <coughs> danielsonkin.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-S-O-N-K-I-N dot C-O-M. <laughs> okay. Don't spell out the dot, right. So, um... Well, I'm always, you know, I always, pr I always put together more slides that I know I can get through, and so I'm, I'm already kind of anxious at the very beginning that I'm not going to get through everything. But my attitude is this, and maybe I need to remind myself of that, is it's better to have more information than less information when you walk away. So when you get the slides, if I don't get to go through everything, you'll, um, um, but I think there's only like 30 slides, so I think we can do it in an hour and a half. So what's so great about attachment? security. Well, I've kind of already gone through this. You know, the children, uh, you know, if, if you want to know who are the secure attachment, securely attached, this was a study that was done um, in, uh, by Everett Waters. If you want to know who the securely attached kids are in a classroom, you ask all the kids to write down their five favorite friends in the classroom. And then you collect all that information, and then you look at it, and look for the names that come up the most. And those are going to be your securely attached kids. And because and that is what's so wonderful about attachment security. It, you know, the kids, they tend to like themselves, they tend to have a benign view of others, and others just like to gravitate towards them because they're so positive and optimistic. They're compassionate. Um, they're really sensitive. They're thoughtful. So the, 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 the importance of attachment security is so, can't, can't be understated because when you think about what it results in in terms of people's lives and, and how um, it, it contributes to, you know, uh, all, all kinds of positive attributes, not only in their personality, but in terms of their experiences, it's really, you know, it's pretty, a pretty amazing thing. 
Um, so they engage in more elaborate make-believe play, they're more enthusiastic about um, doing things, they're flexible and persistent in problem-solving, they have high self-esteem, they're socially competent, they're cooperative with their peers, they're liked by peers, there's a whole body of literature on secure attachment and empathy um, showing the, the correlation. There's also some really interesting research on secure base priming as a way of boosting empathy. And of course, that's something many of us do in our psychotherapy with people, is having people be more empathic towards their partners, their friends, their family members, their children. Uh, they have closer friendships, they have really good social skills, and then I've, I've mentioned to you about the adults, they just tend to be happier people, okay? Um, they regulate their emotions adaptively. That's really the key thing here, is that when they're um, feeling vulnerable, they're able to talk about their vulnerability. Um, when they're um, uh, sad, they're able to talk about that. When they're angry, they can talk about that. But it's all done in a respectful, positive, adaptive way, okay? Now, uh, oftentimes it comes up, the question is, you know, is insecure attachment, are we talking about psychopathology? And, and we're not. We're really talking about, you know, the clinical literature is interested in looking at psychopathology and looking at mental health, aspects of mental health, but the, you, you have to understand the attachment literature has come out of the development, the child development literature, and then subsequently in the social psychology literature for adults. And oftentimes they are not particularly interested in, in psychopathology. They're, they're interested in measuring this construct of what we, what we call attachment security. And, um, and though you might say, wow, secure attachment seems like kind of the, the model of mental health or the absence of psychopathology, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily true. People with secure attachment also get depression. Uh, they get anxiety, they may have trauma and experience post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, that, that people with secure attachment have mental disorders as well. But that being said, people have been interested in looking at the overlap between psychopathology and attachment security or insecurity. And this is what's been found. It's, it's just some just very general findings, probably the most the population that's been studied the most has been the disorganized. And the reason for that is because disorganized infants start manifesting fairly severe um, impairments in interpersonal functioning so early in life um, that, that they have been kind of gotten the most attention over the years in terms of research. And of course, they have sh higher rates of dissociation, PTSD, attention and emotion regulation problems, and borderline personality disorder. So it's probably been the, the, the most studied uh, group of, of uh, uh, you know, attachment styles uh, that have been studied. Um, but dismissing um, uh, have shown to have higher deficits in, uh, in social competence, um, conduct disorders, as well as higher, higher rates of schizophrenia. Um, and so there, sh you know, there is some overlap there. And then the preoccupied, because they tend to be so anxious, they have higher rates of affective disorders, particularly anxiety and substance abuse. So just be careful when you're using the terms attachment, uh, insecure attachment, preoccupied or dismissing, you're not really talking about a diagnosis. You're talking about um, a, a form of affect regulation essentially, and maybe secondarily, you're talking about how people view themselves in relationship to others, okay? Can I yeah. Um, where would depression fall in that um, Depression, uh, preoccupied people do, you know, manifest depression quite often because, um, and certainly disorganized manifest depression quite often because of, um, uh, you know, th there is this, you know, you know, really breakdown of uh, what um, Mary Main calls from Berkeley a collapse of cognitive strategies. This is um, what they think is happening with disorganized infants and adults is that the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system is activated at the same time. 
Um, the, the sympathetic system is the active system. It's, you know, fight or flight. Parasympathetic is the, the system that, that quiets us. It's the system that gets activated and strengthened when we are meditating, when we're relaxing, when we're sleeping. And um, that these are opposing systems. This is like the brakes and the accelerator. And what they think with disorganized is that both these systems are activated and it's like blows a fuse in the brain. And so um, it's, it's the worst form of attachment, it has the, lo the, the worst outcomes later in life. Um, the good news is that um, researchers like Mary Dossier has taken uh, 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 disorganized infants at 12 months of age, put them in foster care with secure mothers for six months, and then retested them in the strange situation, and they've come out secure. So it shows you how flexible the brain is, and it also shows you the power of secure attachment. 12 months of age to 18 months of age. 12 months of age, they were assessed as having disorganized attachment. They were placed in, um, in, in, in the care of securely attached mothers, based on the adult attachment interview. And six, within six months, these kids um, were securely, uh, assessed as securely attached. Now this is at a very early time in life. And of course, the problem with our work, I was just talking with a colleague yesterday about you know, the, the, the challenges for therapists, is that we're not working with a blank slate. You know, with, with infants, you're working with a, uh, with a brain that's still developing. But we're, d we're working with people oftentimes where the brain is already solidified. The, 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 the wiring is, is established. And we're trying to change the wiring versus create new connections um, as you might do with a, with a younger child. So um, uh, certainly that makes, it, makes, makes the work with people with insecure attachment. It's why it's so hard and it's why why I'm thinking about, well, what other things can we do? What other activities can uh, clients be involved in that, that um, support the work that's being done face-to-face, -face? okay? Um, this is, I've already said a little bit about this. The most robust predictor of a child's attachment is the attachment style of that parent. Um, it was very interesting. I saw a movie last night and I remembered the name this morning, but then I forgot the name <laughs> again on the way up. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's about a, a woman who gets pregnant on a kind of a, uh, her first date with a guy. And it's kind of all about she's trying to be a comedian. And anyhow, it doesn't matter what the name of it is. But the point is, is that uh, she, during, a, during the movie, when she found out she was pregnant, she decided she was going to have an abortion, she goes to her parents and decides to tell them. Now they're divorced, so she has a scene with her father and a scene with her mother. And it was very interesting seeing how she related differently to her father and to her mother. And because it was clear that the father had a kind of a, a different kind of attachment relationship with her, and she was much more careful with the mother who was a little bit more standoffish. And so it was, it was, it was really interesting to see how um, children, and I, we all can relate to this, we will relate to people partly based on our experience of, with that person. So we might be very open with one person, but very cautious with another. Well, this is what, what happens with children, is that they very quickly get a read on their parents, very, very quickly. And so a child could have a secure attachment with one parent, but an insecure attachment with another parent, and that they will go back and forth, demonstrating securely attached behaviors with one parent, but demonstrating insecure attachment with the other parent. And, um, and so people then ask, well, how do they decide if they're secure or insecure, and how does that all develop over time? There's still a lot of question about that, but what they think is, is that overall, you know, what happens is that over time, the brain kind of starts developing just generalized models. And instead of having a different model for each person in the world, the brain has a kind of a generalized approach to um, close relationships. Because, you know, the brain is always, you know, it's a very complex organ, and it's always looking for efficiency. 
And that's why so much of our behavior is unconscious or not conscious because if we had to think about what we were doing every minute, every, every second of the day, we would be exhausted. So a lot of, lot of behaviors are, are, are put into an automatic system, okay? So the most robust attachment styles are very stable over time. This is the work of the Minnesota Mother Child uh, Project in, in, at the University of um, Minnesota. Um, and they found there's about 80% continuity. So if you measure somebody at 12 months of age, about an 80% chance that you measure them at, 20, at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they're gonna be the same attachment style, okay? But that means discontinuity is 20%. So what's that about? Well, what they say is that um, about 20% of people change. And what's most typical direction that people change is from the insecure to the more secure. And so they have all this data that they've been following people for 30 or 40 years. And what do you think the most, um, most common variable to the kids who go from insecure to secure? A relationship with a securely attached person. Like a therapist. Like a therapist. Right, right. So the most common cause of this continu continuity is the presence of a secure attachment figure. And this is the study that I told you about, the disorganized infant. So attachment security, what does that say? It says that therapists ideally should be securely attached. And if we're not, that's why we should go to therapy or have a close attachment uh, relationships in our lives, secure attachment relationships in our lives. Like in the, in the movie As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson, who had OCD. Remember he said, I couldn't, um, uh, uh, he couldn't say I love you to Helen Hunt. Um, but what was the thing that he said that, that got as close as he could get? He says, you make me want to be a better person. And that's what being around, and that's why I married a securely attached woman, um, because it helped boost me to a better place. And um, in fact, the work of Carolyn and, and Phil Cowan at Berkeley have shown that, that most of the time, securely attached people tend to hook up with securely attached people. Occasionally, though, Securely attached people might hook up with somebody who's mildly insecure. And if you track them over time, the insecure becomes more secure. So it could, probably. <laughs> and it does. It does work. There are kids who, uh, who have started off secure and, um, uh, um, in their studies who uh, um, become insecure as they get older. And the reason for that is trauma, loss, huge, huge crises that happened in their lives that just really set them back. But what they do follow, what they have found is when they continue to follow those kids, um, they, they seem to have an easier time kind of moving back into attachment security as they get older, if they get into therapy, um, if they find a secure attachment in their life. So those kids have that, that, that early experience of attachment security um, to help them uh, manage going through um, uh, um, maybe a period of time where they, they regress to a, a, a more insecure state. Uh, yeah. That last point about when the infant took place with uh, six months. For yeah, six 12 months, months, yeah, for six months, yeah. Are they taken away from their family of origin or is it? <laughs> they were, their yeah, because they were either abused or neglected they um, were placed in foster care. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, so therapist as an attachment figure, as John mentioned. Okay, so um, Bowlby was actually trained as an analyst, and um, of course he was rejected for many, many, many years, and, and even until his death, uh, his son was apologized by the, the British Analytic Society for, for the way they treated his father. Um, but he expanded his developmental theory uh, later in his life to include psychotherapy. Um, and he did view the therapist as an attachment figure whom the client can turn to for comfort, safety, and help. And that makes absolute sense that we would become an attachment figure for our, our clients. Um, and if the therapist was sufficiently attuned to the client's signals, and responsive to the client's needs, it would result in the client feeling relief from distress and felt security. 
repeated experiences of seeking and receiving care from the therapist would lead the client to develop feeling generalized feelings of self-worthiness and foster beliefs that it was possible to receive care and comfort of others. So in other words, change those working models, right? And at the same time, experience relief from distress through positive interventions by the therapist.